Y'all ready for it? Uh, April 20th, a uh, Longhorn spring game. We got the weather holding off a, real, a little bit right now. Uh, maybe a little bit of sprinkle, but not too much, Rod. Uh, you ready for a spring game today? Uh, I've been ready for some actual real football. We've been talking about it. It feels like forever. Uh, and the Longhorns, once again, high expectations. It's been a long time since we've been talking about a team that's that's this good that we expect to be this good. Uh, so this is probably the, one of the more anticipated spring games in the last 15 years. Got to be. There's no question about it. And thank you guys for all coming out. Appreciate all this. All you guys coming out. We consider y'all family. Good to have a little family reunion out here at Victory Lab. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to the folks at Victory Lab, too, for having everybody out and opening up a little bit early. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a hot spot for the kids. Uh, which is a little bit later. They 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 make it a hot spot from like ten to midnight. You know, this is for the this is for the folks who get here early. Uh, Longhorns Rod uh, also hosting a number of recruits on campus today. Uh, Jerry uh, Hamilton and C.J. Vogel over by Moncrief Newhouse right now. Uh, whether it's uh, the two defensive linemen coming in from uh, out of state, one Bill Norton is already on campus uh, from the University of Arizona. Jay Toya out of UCLA. We spotted them yesterday. Uh, with us. Uh, now we've got uh, some blue chip recruits coming in from the high school level today, uh, including uh, Riley Pettijan, linebacker out of McKinney, uh, KJ Edwards, a big tight end out of California that Jeff Banks has been on. Uh, so there's been a number of guys. Uh, what, you know, you, you've been to spring games before Rod and uh, you know how it is with recruiting. What, what's going through uh, the player's mind right now? What's going through a recruit's mind? You've been on both sides of this, dude. What What are you thinking? Um, I think for the players uh, right now, it's it's almost like an, an individual journey. Um, you're trying to work on uh, certain aspects of your game. Coaches have talked to you about your game, where you stand with the team, uh, where you stand in your developmental path, uh, your rate of development as a player. So there's just so much of your game you're trying to cultivate and work on, and the spring game is the culmination of that. Uh, so I'm excited for a lot of these young guys. I mean, think about, okay, when I was a senior, the spring game experience is, is very different, right, from when I'm a freshman. When I'm a senior, I mean, honestly, I'm out there. I, I'm not playing a lot. Uh, I don't I – mean, I probably played three series or so uh, because I was already a proven commodity. I'd already earned the trust of the coaches. Different experience. A lot of guys out there now trying to earn the trust of the coaches, trying to earn more reps on the field. The coaches want to see these guys make big plays in – clutch moments yeah, in critical moments, like but also do it on a big stage. And this is not the biggest stage, but it's a big stage. Uh, so the movie that is Texas football for the 2024 season, this is uh, the trailer for it, right? This is a little trailer for the movie. And hopefully what the Longhorns see gets them even more excited about uh, the upcoming season. For the recruits, you know, I, it's a different experience now because I wasn't on campus as a recruit for the spring game. Um, but I imagine they want to see something exciting. Sark wants them to see something exciting out there and have their own personal connection. I know if I was a recruit, I'm watching my position. So if I'm a DB, I'm watching the DBs. If I'm a linebacker, I'm watching the linebackers. I'm a, if I'm a quarterback, I'm watching the QBs. Uh, so you do want to have a great performance if you've got a lot of uh, recruits out there uh, and you want to show off the – the overall athletic profile of this team and the capability and potential of this team. I, I tell you a couple of notes uh, that, that I had going into today. I'm told that Quinn Ewers will be on a pitch count of sorts, Makes sense. which is exactly what you just talked yeah. about. We may see him two or three series at most. Uh, so be aware of that, but there's a positive to that. We haven't seen a lot of Arch Manning yet. That's right. Haven't seen much of Trey Owens at all. Uh, this will be his debut to most uh, Longhorn fans. Uh, and then, you know, we also have, to your point, we'll be seeing more of the young defensive backs because guys like Jade Barron, yep. not going to see a lot of time today. Michael Taft and those guys probably going to be out of there. Barron, Sorrell, he's going to be a third-year guy. Yep. Alfred Collins, third-year guy. You're going to see a bunch of new faces uh, for the Longhorns. Is there anybody in particular, Rod, that you are really anxious to get a chance oh. to see uh, and uh, get out and, and take a look at? Oh, there's so many guys. Uh, I feel like I can, I can go on here for a few minutes, but uh, I'll just name kind of the top three. Uh, I really want to see these edges. I think the edges are different than they've been here in Texas in a while. Guys, just watch the BGO, the ball get off. Uh, Trey, between Trey Moore, between Colin Simmons, they're built different on the edges now. Different explosivity, different twitchiness on the edge. Uh, and that's where the I, I project the strength of your defensive line is going to be. Uh, we know that from what Texas is doing in the portal. 
when it comes to the interior D-line, which we can talk about later. So I want to see Trey Moore. I want to see Ethan Burke, obviously. I want to see Baron Sproul. I don't think those guys will play as much, but those young edges, when I'm hearing about Colin Simmons, what we've heard about Trey Moore, Trey Moore might be your, I don't think he might, I think he is, your best natural pass rusher on campus right now. Um, and I think that's the guy that's going to make a huge difference for Texas. Uh, other guys, Ryan Wingo. Uh, the truth is, in terms of physical traits and physical gifts, you haven't had a wide receiver with the combination of physical traits and, and physical gifts um, on campus like Ryan Wingo since Roy Williams. I, I do believe in terms of just the, 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 the body type, the frame, um, the skills, the speed, the agility, explosive. He's got everything. Um, you haven't seen a receiver with all those traits in a long time. So I want to see how it looks because um, I'm sure it's going to look different with him out there. Um, the DBs, uh, let's be honest, guys. DBs were a liability. They have been since Sark's been on campus. Uh, I was I went back and I don't know why I must be a, a masochist. <laughs> I went back and rewatched the Sugar Bowl like three days ago. I have no idea why I did that. It's not yeah, I, I do not advise anybody to go do that for any reason. But I wanted to go see the DBs again and see if it was as bad as I thought it was. Um, and especially giving up the deep balls over the top. I believe they were what was it either six of eight on passes twenty yards or more down the field. Uh, the Texas secondary has been a liability and a weakness for Texas. And they've been tested. Right? Think about what they're going against in practice every day. They were going against Xavier Worthy, A.D. Mitchell. Now they're going against this deep group of wide receivers. They should take a leap this year. Manny Muhammad. I see my man wearing the man. There you go. Wearing the Manny <laughs> Muhammad jersey, baby. Yeah. Natural ball hawk. He should be one of the guys that takes a step up. Derek Williams should pick up where he left off last year. as the best coverage safety, even as a freshman for Texas. And we're not going to see a lot of Jaday Barron, but I'm hearing Jalen Gilbo is looking good. And he's going to give them ability to stabilize the nickel position, move today bearing around the formation a little bit. So I, those are the guys that I'm just top of mind. Obviously everybody wants to see Arch. So we can talk about Arch for about 10 minutes if you want to. But <laughs> I want to see Arch too. I think it's great, but you know, the spring game is half glass, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. If Arch is out there willing and dealing and he's out there throwing strikes and eating up the secondary, y'all going to be celebrating. I'm going to be stressing about the secondary. Like, man, the secondary <laughs> looking bad out there. In the dirty. So you'd like to see wins on both sides in, in, in the spring game. Defense winning their fair share, offense winning their fair share. And competitive wins. Yes. Competitive yeah. wins. So yeah. the one thing I would say about the, the, the Washington game, a lot of those catches downfield were competitive. They catches. were contested. Yeah, yes. they were contested. Um, Tyler Mazer here says, Arch going 13 of 15 for 265 See, today. This is not what Rod Bader's <laughs> wants. He, he wants like 10 of 15 Damn. for like a buck 15 yeah. is what Rod wants. A PBU or two, something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, look, we can talk about uh, things like that all the time. You mentioned the DBs. I'm interested in Jelani McDonald. Yeah. Uh, see exactly how his transition yep. to safety is taken. I think that's a big piece of it, Rod. Right. And then I, I would add to you uh, that, you know, Andrew Makuba, uh, the newcomer from Clemson, exactly how is he going to be integrated into the into the rotation? Because we know Michael Taft is a leader of this team. And that's I, the coaches are, are 100 percent into that. Uh, the players are into that, too, because they know what he gives to the team. Uh, and then you have Derek Williams, who is, frankly, maybe the most talented guy in the secondary overall, regardless of class. Uh, so you have all of that. And then you look at uh, you look at some other guys, uh, the receiver group right now. Uh, you mentioned Ryan Wingo. I was talking to Scott here. Uh, it was here earlier. He actually helped some guys in the uh, St. Louis area and Dallas area Whoa. with football. And he actually has been seeing Ryan Wingo, uh, he said, for years. And, you know, we talked about Wingo. And he said he's just a different caliber athlete. Yep. Um, and so this will be a first time for a lot of people to be able to see him. Uh, by the way, where's number five? Which is the same oh, as Manny Muhammad. So you're okay. gonna have to get used to that, guys, on on uh, stuff. Uh, but we're gonna take your questions here. We're at the victory lap. Uh, it's uh, about uh, an hour and a half right now until mm. kickoff for the Longhorns' uh, 2024 spring game. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers. Uh, we've got a bunch of different questions coming in here. Uh, let's go ahead and start with a couple of them. Uh, let's start with a little recruiting talk uh, from Peter Gonzalez. Do we have a count? on how many recruits will be in attendance today. I got a text from Jerry Hamilton while this podcast was going on. He says about two dozen at least okay. wow. now that he's seen, he and CJ Vogel have seen so far. We think it'll exceed that number. Uh, but how far, we don't know. Uh, Riley Pettijan, I mentioned the linebacker out of McKinney, uh, is here already. There's a number of other players uh, as well. So uh, we'll go from there. 
All right, we're also going to take your questions, so please feel free to uh, line them up in the chat. Uh, we'll take them as we go. Uh, Rod, any of anything else that you're kind of wanting to see today from the Longhorns that maybe maybe is kind of an under the radar type thing? Uh, it's not a I want to see Arch Manning or mm. I want to see Jelani make up. Like, is it Trey Wisner? Mm. Is it how do they integrate the new running backs? Uh, maybe Amari Nyblack. What are the things that you think are under the radar that we should be looking for today? Mm. Uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, I'll start with tight end. Um, losing JT Sanders was huge. He was kind of amused for Sark. I think he was probably the most physically gifted tight end that Sark's ever had. Um, now you have Gunnar Helm. And by the way, I love Gunnar Helm's mentality. He's about business. Uh, and I think he's going to be great. But I don't know if he, he's the matchup nightmare that a guy like JT Sanders was. But then you got Warren Davis, who's starting to really complimentary of Warren Davis. He's also brought in Amari Nightblack, who's, I mean, just a straight up speed. He's definitely your fastest tight end vertically. Um, Sark says the tight end position is the second most important position in his offense behind quarterback. So I just wonder what's going to be, you know, the the rotation at tight end. Who's he going to end up trusting next to Gunnar Helm? I mean, think about it, guys. They play 12 personnel, one back, two tight ends. Second most uh, as popular uh, or favorite personnel package for Sark. So you're, who you're, who you're a second tight end is, is really big. And it can make your offense predictable if you're a second tight end. It's a guy that can only go down and run routes and he's not a great blocker. Or you don't have a gun to him, can't necessarily win one-on-ones. That's going to determine a lot. And I also think if that is the case, you will see more than two tailback sets. Everybody know I love two tailback sets. I think you may see it in the spring game, the pony package where he actually just plays two tailbacks, whether it's Trey Weisner, C.J. Baxter, or C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue, or a different combination of. It's easily the most explosive, most efficient personnel grouping. And now I think it's part of the staples of the offense. Sark's not going to show you any wrinkles, guys. Y'all not going to see any new cheat codes or loopholes. That ain't happening because he doesn't want a future opponents to get any advantage. But you're going to see the core of his offense, right, the staples, the go-to elements of his offense. And I think the two tailback set might, might be a go-to element now. I think it's now he's at a point now he's stockpiling so many great running backs. He may decide, you know what, that's just part of our identity. That's part of our DNA as an offense. Uh, that's one thing. Also, I'll throw out there, um, you know, linebacker. Linebacker opposite Anthony Hill. Is, is it Bender? I've heard Bender is right now the front runner for that job. But you have so many different body types that can play that job, right? Maurice Blackwell is a hybrid safety linebacker. David Bennett is kind of your old school, old school uh, run, uh, run force linebacker. You got Black was like 250, 260 pounds at linebacker. You got uh, Leandro LaFowle, who probably fits more of the prototypical linebacker that PK wants. So many different body types. I wonder how they're going to uh, fill that void at linebacker that was left by Jalen Ford. We know Anthony Hill is going to be the top guy. But then I do wonder uh, who's going to end up winning that job. Will it be Benda? And if it is Benda, you know, what level of play is he going to be performing at? I would agree with that. Uh, we had a good question here because last year, um, last year Texas allowed one transfer to play. A uh, guy that had now announced his transfer was Jaden Alexis, mm. uh, a wide receiver who had battled back from injury. Uh, he announced his transfer on the Saturday okay. of the spring game, and Sark went ahead and let him finish the spring break game. And so uh, Burton Orange Horn asks, are there any announced transfers playing today? To my knowledge, no. Uh, and obviously those transfers at this point are Jamon Tapp, the defensive end, Billy Walton, defensive end. I will say this, to my knowledge, Walton is not officially in the transfer portal yet. So that's something to watch. I don't know if they're trying to work some things behind the scenes. Or what have you. Uh, then also Peyton Kirkland, the offensive lineman, uh, and I'm trying to remember the other one. Can't remember all the oh, time. Samaj Burrell. Samaj Burrell, the Samaj linebacker. Yeah. Uh, the the question then becomes: Are there going to be any additional guys go into the transfer portal after today? Um, and uh, you know, I think that it's likely. Uh, how many? We don't know yet. Uh, but uh, just from what I'm hearing behind the scenes, I don't expect it to be an avalanche. Uh, which is one of the things I was concerned with. And yeah. I think it's a natural concern because uh, Steve Sarkeesian built the roster in such a way that you want to keep building on top of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he's done really well is not only is he recruited at a very high level on some marquee players, but they're also developing players. Yep. And, you know, Billy Walton's an example that you would have liked to seen stay at Texas because he's shown some flashes, but he's gone within a year. So, what 
he doesn't get a chance to ever be a David Benda. Nope. You know what I mean? Or a guy that, that Jonathan comes on, Brooks, a Jonathan yeah. Brooks, those yeah. kind of guys that come on later, mm -hmm. but still have talent. And so I think that what I'm watching, uh, not only is the incoming recruits that we've been talking about or transfers, portal transfers, Rod, but some of the off-field stuff, right, that, that deals with roster construction and team uh, construction as well. I, I think that the Longhorns right now are in a great position with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always that but. you got to wait to see uh, exactly what happens uh, and go from there. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a couple other questions. Here's one. Uh, you know, we had uh, uh, some Hawaiians on the team now. Uh, Miss 817, Mr. Talk Too Much. Yeah. How do how do Leonga Lavau and Cecilia Akana look? Uh, that's going to be interesting. We haven't talked about Leonga Lavau no. uh, or Cecilia Akana much this offseason. Although I'm being told that Lafau right now is running second team at middle linebacker ahead of Kendrick Blackshire, wow. uh, which is yeah. interesting because Blackshire, the the transfer Alabama. from Alabama, was thought to be a he's going to be a run plugger, a guy that can kind of back up Benda and or Anthony Hill. But I've, I'm being told that Lafau has kind of been the number two guy right now. Akana is more of an edge prospect. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, you look at all of this, whether it's a linebacker, tight end that you mentioned, defensive back, uh, the Longhorns really in, in a situation right now uh, where they can uh, and should be a better team overall mm -hmm. with the depth that they have. I mean, we just mentioned Leon Lafau. We haven't mentioned much at all. Nope. But frankly, he was a national recruiter year ago. Yeah, and I'm with you. I think uh, right now Texas has first world problems on their roster. Yeah. Uh, the only position <laughs> where, put it. where they may have, you know, some more I don't know, dire issues would be interior D line. And you know, from all the reports that you guys have, have had over the last couple of days, they are going to address that aggressively <laughs> uh, in the in the spring portal. So yeah, I, I think with a lot of these positions right now that we're looking at, you have uh, frontline guys you can depend on. Um, linebacker David Bender being one of those guys, but I do wonder situationally, team to team, matchup wise, if all those guys will fit. David Bender had some coverage issues last season, and you could expose him in coverage. So, do they like when they're playing a team that's pass happy to have a guy like Mo Blackwell out there instead? Or that's why I like Alejandro Lafau because he's more of an every down linebacker to me, or at least projects to be that way. That's not necessarily Bender. That's not necessarily Blackshear. You know some of these other guys, and even I wonder if Blackwell also can fit into that category. He's more of a guy that was more there. Um, he was a hybrid last year. They would use him as a way of uh, really supplementing their sub packages instead of having an, a nickel out there. You have him out there, and he represents a hybrid a nickel or a safety slash linebacker. So I do wonder exactly what their plan is at linebacker, and it may be just a stockpile enough capable guys that if you play a team that wants to run downhill on you i got bender i got black shear you play a team that wants to throw and expose those guys in coverage i got blackwell we got leon the foul so i just wonder how they'll approach it yeah it, it's going to be interesting they, they've got a they got number it. of different pieces yeah. that they can do rod um all right i want to say thank you to our sponsor uh our sponsor for this morning is adam lowey of the lowey law firm if you have been injured in a car wreck accident a motorcycle, bike, ATV, what have you, and you think you may be due compensation, uh, give Adam and his group a call, LoweyLawFirm.com. They've been doing it for 20 plus years in the Austin area and across the state of Texas. Again, it's a free consultation. Uh, we appreciate it. Adam and his team and uh, them sponsoring uh, tech on Texas football. They are part of why we're able to bring you guys uh, so much content and we appreciate them very much. I also want to thank you to the folks uh, today at the Victory Lap for allowing us to come together and get out here and get ready for the spring game, have a little fun in pregame and enjoy talking a little Longhorn football today. Uh, it is drizzling right now, but it is not a heavy. No. It is not a heavy drizzle. Mm. Uh, the latest, I just looked up the latest radar, heavy starting at four, but it could rain a little like bit that. beforehand. Uh, so we'll see what, exactly what happens. Hopefully it holds off until one o'clock today. Uh, I think if it does, uh, we're going to all get the chance to see uh, what these Longhorns look like. Uh, I don't know. You know I was worried. I got to be honest. I was worried uh, earlier this week about this because I'd come down here, try to <laughs> get ready know. for it, make a big deal about the, the spring game. And I saw the weather forecast. And then I woke up this morning and said, heavy rain doesn't start till four o'clock. And now, now I'm hoping the weather. I all week I've been hoping the weatherman was wrong, exactly. and now I'm hoping he's right. 
Yeah, you got it's a 50 50 shot. It's like it's yeah, 50 50 shot. Uh, and so that, I've been uh, in that uh, in that uh, pain, yeah. uh, so to speak, for a little while here. But uh, it does look like it's just overcast. It hasn't. Uh, the skies have opened up. No, I would say that either uh, the water hasn't opened up and the sun hasn't opened up. Either way, it's drizzle is the drizzle is almost pleasant right now. It's weird. Yeah, it, it is. It's <laughs> after an eighty, after almost ninety <laughs> degrees on Wednesday or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, all right. Let's get back to uh, some more questions that we had here. That I thought that were pretty good overall. Here, let's start with this one from Chris Roberts. Uh, who will be oh. the MVP of the spring game if the weather holds? <laughs> yeah, it definitely will be a defensive guy. Defense, it's hard to win MVPs as a defensive guy, even if they play well. Uh, Manny would have to get two picks, or somebody have to have even you know three or four sacks in the game. And by the way, Sark ain't gonna let that happen either because Sark wants his offense to have confidence, and that's part of recruiting. You want your offense to look that bad. So I'm gonna go with an offensive guy. It's gonna be either a running back, one of those running backs, and it could be a Trey Wise who just plays a lot, right? Because you're not gonna see a lot of CJ Baxter, you're probably gonna see a little bit more Jaden Blue. You might see a lot of Trey Weiser and start to be really complimentary about how good he looks and how much they're using him. So Trey Weiser is on that list for me. And I know everybody's hoping it's Arch. Don't be surprised, though, because we know Quinn's not going to play a lot. I'm telling you, all Trey Owens, He every time I watch Trey Owens on film, I'm more impressed than before. He, he's got a nice arm. He's got great confidence as a young player, which is what you need if you're going to be, you know, backing up Arch Manning. <laughs> and Quinn Ewers, um, and I, he's got a, I mean, he's got a great touch on the football, and his deep ball is a strain. He's got a, honestly, probably got a better deep ball than Quinn. He's a natural better deep ball thrower than Quinn might be. You know what I'm saying? He can make, Quinn makes all the throws, but I'm telling you, Trey Owens, will have, he, he's going to, he's going to surprise some people, and he'll impress you. I guarantee you out there today. If, especially if they got some of those wide receivers like the Matthew Goldens and DeAndre Moores and Ryan Wingo, like if they those guys are rotating in with his group, oh, he might do some damage. I'm gonna go with one of three people. Okay. Here are my people. Uh, I think uh, I'm gonna go with Arch Manning. I think he's the odds-on favorite, given the fact that we've already talked about uh, Quinn Ewers being on a pitch mm -hmm. count today. Yep. John T. Cook, possible wide receiver. I think he's the one guy out of that receiver group that Arch Manning has some rapport with. UT boy. Uh, based over, <laughs> uh, based over that. Uh, and then the last one, I'll go with Manny Muhammad. We've heard Ooh. that he's dominated some practices this summer yes, or this spring, and so I would add those. Now, Rod, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna transition here, and I'm gonna make you read this. Give it to me. Here we go, <laughs> Bobby. Between <laughs> Rod's hands and the wet weather, I don't have a lot of faith that, <laughs> that Mike finishing the show. If <laughs> you keep passing it back and forth, <laughs> hey, listen, I I will say this about my hands, man. I count the I count the ones that matter. You know that. <laughs> Big game, Oklahoma, a Big 12 title game. I caught those, but I dropped my fair share. This is true. They, these are real Lohan fans. They remember. All right. I'm, I'm top five all the time in PBUs at the University of Texas. And half of those are, damn, I screwed up type PBUs. Or, damn it, I should have had that interception. So I get that. But I caught the ones that matter. That's true. Thank y'all for y'all support. Yeah. I love it, Rod. Yeah. Rod, you're so personable, man. It's cool. I, I, Guys, uh, we've got about uh, 15 more minutes here before we're going to get headed over to the DKR. A lot of people are going to get in and out of this. Uh, we've got some other comments here. Burn Orange Horn. Uh, we have not heard if Malik Ogbo is still playing TE. Yeah. He was also second string guard one week. He is he's working at both. Yeah. So we actually have heard that. So he is still being that bonus uh, size tight end when they go heavy. With, when big they go 11, heavy. Big 12. Big 11 or big 12 personnel. Yeah. He is the big. Mm -hmm. um, and now that's usually in goal line situations or short yardage. Uh, I have not, you know, what's interesting, Sark, if you remember two years ago when they just kind of took it to Baylor mm -hmm. in the second half oh, yeah. and they brought in Andre Karich at the time yep. uh, and really just went exclusively to that Big 12 personnel and kind of ran it down their throat. Ran duo. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they have done a little bit more with that over time. And I think it's going to be interesting because if they do run the pony package with a big – with a big oh, tight end, big twenty one, yeah, 20? yeah, the, because ooh. I think what I'm hearing, uh, what they're doing a lot in practice right now, is putting Jaden Blue in the slot, okay, uh, as part of that, and so we'll see exactly what kind of, I don't know, interesting things that Steve Sarkeesian's kind of dreamed up, because oh. uh, you know he will do that, uh, but Malik Malik Ogbo, 
a big part of the team in many ways. Uh, he's a, kind of, you talk about a guy that may be under the radar in a sense of helping the team. He's it. Yeah. He's a guy. No, I, I love that. And um, you won't see it. If Sarki is working on something funky like that, you won't see it in the spring game. Uh, that's fair. You won't see it in the spring that's game. Fair. But I love what you brought up there because we have seen them play that big 11, big 12, 6 0 line package in more uh, in between a 20 situation, not just situationally uh, in goal line or short yardage or in the red zone. So I think it, Sark is diversifying his palette as a play caller. Guys, it, it, more 21 personnel. We've seen more of that, more of that six so line package. You know, he, he used to be just exclusively 11 personnel guy and 12 personnel. But here in Texas, because I think he's got the luxury of it with all this talent, he's starting to say, you know what, why not use those? I, I got I got a deep O-line group. We got 16 uh, scholarship offensive linemen. Why not use more of them? We got the best o, uh, our running back room in the country. Why not use more of them? I think he's starting to see it. And I wouldn't doubt with this wide receiver room as deep as it is now, guys, we see some of that 10 personnel, which is one back, zero tight ends. At Bama, when he had those four first-round wide receivers, Judy and Waddle and Ruggs and um, all those guys, Devontae Smith, he ran four wide receiver packages. Why not? You got four first-round wide receivers, Nightmare Fuel for a DC. If those wide receivers prove themselves and earned his trust, he could break out a 10 personnel package here. Think about how diverse the offense would be. You're running 10 then, 11, 12, 21, big 11, big 12. If you're a defensive coordinator, that, that's a hell, man. That's hell to have to prepare for a start offense. I, so this is interesting, right? Because uh, college football is not pro football. No. With pro football, first of all, you they're they're all football all the time. They've been doing it for 5, 10, 15 years even at some level, right? Uh, college football is a little bit different. There's 85 guys on scholarship. And so instead of 53 or whatever the number is in the NFL nowadays, uh, and you have to bring them up to speed. Right. Sure. And so Amari Nyblack is a great example. Uh, his offense under Tommy Reese was not what it was uh, mm, yeah. previously. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, how do you use him and get him up to speed as far as movement? Yeah. I mean, and, and that's one of the things that we've heard. Uh, getting the receivers and the tight ends in sync has been a little bit of an issue at yeah, times. That's true. Because if you think about it, you can say, Jatavian Sanders may have ran a 4-7 at the Combine, for example, mm -hmm. but he ran a 4-7 when he played football, too. Yes, he did. It wasn't, it, he didn't all yeah. of a sudden go up to a 4-8. I've said this before, and I think that that's one of the things that Texas is fighting right now with these young receivers is getting everybody on the same page. Um, and I'm, I'm saying all of that to, to, to kind of round into this point of you have all of these players. It's harder for Sark to actually get to where he wants to go because in the pro game, you know what those guys can do yep. and you know they can adapt to it. Yep. Now he's bringing in new concepts to guys they've never seen before. Very true. In the pro game, oh, okay, we're going to go yeah. 20 personnel or we're going to go, well, I know where to line. I mean, it is yeah. different. They haven't been around for three years. I agree with that. It's good point. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how all that goes. It's good point. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's ask a few more questions here. I uh, got some stuff. I got a little note here from uh, Jerry Hamilton. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, go here. Uh, Jerry uh, is said uh, to tell everybody hello here. Uh, Jerry and CJ out uh, doing a uh, little recruiting work right now. Uh, he said, join us at uh, OTF on, on Texas football if you want the latest on recruiting news. He and CJ right now uh, are putting uh, that up on the board. But uh, a lot of good stuff going on at uh, Moncrief Newhouse uh, before the spring game uh, later today. All right. Uh, speaking of one of the things, and I, I this is why I actually – wrote Jerry a little text to get an answer on this. Uh, he and I had talked about this, uh, but did not actually uh, mention it on air yesterday or this morning. Uh, from Daniel Lavelle, uh, what are the thoughts on Carmani McClain, defensive back out of uh, Colorado? He says that teams have reached out to him. Hmm. Texas is on that list. Uh, Carmani is a uh, cornerback, a uh, highly rated one, but did not play much as a true freshman. Uh, at Colorado last year, uh, I told I, I've said this, and uh, Jerry and I have talked about it. They're going to look at guys. They're prioritizing defensive line in the mm -hmm. transfer portal this year. That's no mistake, yeah. right? But uh, the reality of it is, if there is a guy out there that they think can help the team or be a guy that could be a plus plus player later, I mean, Sark calls it big game hunting. Yep. Uh, yeah. Then they're going to do it. I don't know that Kermani McLean though it's necessarily. Fits that. Yeah. Uh, so we we will see. 
Um, all right. Somebody's asking uh, if uh, DJ Campbell is going to suit up today. I think he is, unless there's been something that happened in the last two to three days. Uh, I do not think Vernon Broughton, he may be he may be there, but I'm not sure he's going to be suited up. I'm being oh. told that Vernon is having a very special occasion in his life oh. later today. So oh, uh, we'll follow that. Okay. We'll follow that on where we get a chance. So uh, if, if there's anybody that's not out there, uh, I think it may be Vernon uh, oh. for, for some good things going on in his life. Okay. All right, David uh, Shaklovitz here. Uh, the weather is clearing in Radabor, about an hour away from Austin. <laughs> I've been around a long time. Have anybody ever heard of Radabor before? I don't know. I've no, I've not heard. I, of it. I mean, the 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 amount of different towns that we hear yeah, is know. one of the cool things about this you podcast. Ask Craig Way about that. One. Really, yeah, yeah, Craig Way. No. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Rod, I'll I'll leave this to you um, here uh, from Nathan. Oh, this what is, is the storyline coming out of the game that could improve your outlook on the team? So, what's the is it, is it, uh, um, okay. Is it, let, let me ask you this. Is it Quinn and or Arch being in sync with the receivers or is it Trey Moore getting after the quarterback with Colin Simmons and getting those guys on the ground a little bit more? Those, those are the two that I immediately think of. Mm -hmm. Is there something else you want to add or do you pick one of those? No, that, that, those are both money. Um, the, the wide receiver thing though, I, I still think they have time to figure that out. Because a lot of the hell, Silas Bowden isn't even on campus yet. Yeah, that's fair. So I think they got a little bit more time in the offseason and training camp to figure out the chemistry, continuity, the, the timing of the passing game with Quinn. So if it's not really good in this game, I won't freak out. I probably will freak out if the secondary doesn't look good. The secondary is exposed too much. They're not winning their fair share. Because as I pointed out, every, every position group on the 40 acres has improved since Sark has been here, except secondary. Every group, O-line, D-line, linebackers, tight end, running back, quarterback. The only position group that really has not taken a leap is the secondary. Now, I know I'm a little bit more critical of the secondary than I am any other position, but it's true. All right? And last season, ultimately, the two games you lost, your secondary were arguably the biggest reasons. Secondary and red zone offense. You're not going to – Sark has been hinting that the red zone offense is looking really good in spring. Remember, he's saying basically they're losing 11 11, which is in between the 20s. They're losing team drill. Defense looks really good, not giving up big plays. But when they get inside the inside the red zone, he says the, the, the offense is winning the day in the red zone. I, my theory is that Sark has been obsessed in the offseason with fixing the red zone because they were 120th in the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone. So he's got some new tricks up his sleeve. He's been studying the Shanahan tree and been probably talking to Sean McVay and that crew about red zones. He's got some tricks and he's used those in spring. And that's why they're so successful. We won't see those. Um, so I, I don't know how the red zone offense is going to look, but that would concern me. But the secondary guys, I mean, the secondary that last year, I mean, they were they were a big issue. And I think ultimately, if they don't take a leap this year, it could negate all the advantages you're going to gain with the edge pressure with your edge defenders now being more high level defenders. Well, one of the things I would say to that is I do think um, – let me ask you this. So I, I feel like part of that has been every other position on the team has kind of had high end draftable talent. That's true. Until this past year when we saw Derek Williams and Manny Muhammad come in, maybe Terrence Brooks have also previously. Those are the only three highly ranked guys that are in the secondary and two of them are only sophomores. Yes. Right. And so there's a little bit of that, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. Right. I mean, you have to have the talent in, in there. No doubt. And I would also I would also say this. I mean, the OU game, I know you mentioned the secondary. I'm not so sure a piece of that wasn't on the linebacker group uh, as well. Not containing uh, Dylan Gabriel oh, and yeah. the defensive they front kind of getting out of their lanes. Yeah. Uh, boy, I'm still bitter about the OU game. <laughs> um, but I, I think that my, my point being is that 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 OU game and, and some of the things that we saw on defense last year, it was a it was a. The Washington game wasn't this way, but the OU game was like a team let down yeah. on defense as much as it was just those guys. I, I do believe and, and agree with you that um, even even if uh, Trey Moore and Colin Simmons get out of quarterback, right, it, it still can mitig be mitigated by a poor secondary play, exactly. et cetera. There's no doubt about that. Um, exactly what the offensive 
just how in sync are the receivers? Mm -hmm. That's my my takeaway. And to your point, I agree with you about Silas Bolden, not even here yet, and he could be your slot guy. Uh, but uh, let's also see what let's see what DeAndre Moore does today. Yeah, I haven't talked about him at all. Like that, uh, and should uh, I'm thinking that's uh, that's one of those things as well. Uh, that we'll be talking about. All right, uh, we're here at the Victory Lap. I'm, lap. I'm uh, Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers. Got some people here. Thank you all for coming out, by the way. Everybody ready for the spring game? Yeah, let's do it, man. Uh, we we got about an hour to go uh, before that. We're going to get away, get uh, step away here from uh, the uh, mic in about five minutes here, but I uh, wanted to keep this going. Uh, let's go to a local, couple other things. Uh, y'all take care. Hook, hook them. Uh, Kelly Hill. Nice hat, Rod. Hey. Everybody talks about every time Rod wears the SEC Longhorn hat, they come up and I'm around. They come up and ask you where you can get that, they and don't. you have to you have to bow out and say, "Ah, it's bootleg material." Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I it, it it I think it'll be available like once the we're officially the SEC. When is that? In June or something like that? June or July? I think it'll be available. But yeah, I got some friends and they hooked me up with it. So it's it definitely is bootleg, but it looks official. So I I appreciate the compliments. But I can't get another one just because I don't have another. One. If I had another one, I'd give it to you guys. If I had access to it, I would. I was hanging out with some folks who are really excited about the move to the SEC, and they made their own hats. The group made their own hats. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm being told by as it relates to the SEC. By the way, I'm being told that there's going to be a celebration on campus oh. um, on June 30th. Nice. Yeah, it's supposed to be at that Ooh. time of year when the uh, the official move, I believe, it's either May 30th or yeah, June 30th. Yeah, something so, like that. Yeah. Don't I, I can't remember exactly which one, but uh, it's going to be that day, and there's going to be booth set up of all of the different schools wow. on campus. So you, they're going to try to make it a big deal, uh, have people come out, hang out a little bit, like uh, enjoy their time, and uh, get going that way. Uh, stuff stuff that's going to be fun and interesting as it relates to being a part of a, a major conference, right? Yeah, that no uh, is a little bit different than what it's been in the Big Twelve. I'm not a I'm not this big lover of the SEC or anything like that. I never had this fall in love thing with it the, the last 20 years. But I think from a Texas football perspective, when you, as a season ticket holder, you got to look at the schedule now mm -hmm. compared to just a year ago and say, man, I want to go to that game. Oh yeah, and man. I want to go to that game. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you have Georgia, Florida. Those are, those are big name programs coming to town. Yeah. Uh, and so as we're sitting here at the spring game uh, and looking around and knowing uh, what this place can be like in the fall, should be a lot of fun uh, following the Longhorns this year, uh, entering into a new conference. Well, and they're good again. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'd all be freaking out if they low, we didn't expect Longhorns actually to go to the SEC and compete to win the SEC. Uh, but Sark's done a great job of turning around a program in the three years he's been here. So that's why everybody's excited. And that's why antis anticipation-wise, we haven't had a spring game with this much build-up to it in a decade or so. Decade or more. Yeah, all right. I, guess, I tell you what, that's going to do it for this uh, morning. Madrid. We're going to get ready to get going here. Uh, we got to hook him from Madrid. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> he's already drinking wine. Yeah. He's, not even, he's not on margarita and beer. He's already in yeah. wine. It's nighttime there in Madrid. All right, uh, guys, that's going to do it for this uh, pregame special here from the Victory Lap. We appreciate everyone coming out. We appreciate those uh, that were there. Thank you also to Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm for his sponsorship. Uh, guys, let's go enjoy the game. Hopefully the weather holds. Amen. Uh, everybody, hook him. Hook, hook him, guys.